Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. I'm Krishnan Giri Murthy and this is the podcast in which we talk to extraordinary people about the big ideas in their lives and the events that have helped shape them. Now this week we are recording from Ukraine where I've been covering the war for Channel 4 News but we couldn't be speaking to a more apt guest because joining us today is the professor of politics um, at Stanford University, Francis Fukuyama. Now, of course, he's most famous, perhaps, for that book 30 years ago, The End of History and the Last Man, but he has a new work out at the moment, one of many. It's called Liberalism and its Discontents, and it's very relevant to everything that is going on today. Francis Fukuyama, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very much for having me. Let's begin with the war, straightforwardly. What, what do you think this war is fighting for? Is it, is it more than Ukraine? Yes, definitely. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainians themselves are fighting for the independence and sovereignty of their country, but there's a much larger issue at stake because the ambitions of Vladimir Putin are much larger. Uh, he wants to not just reincorporate uh, Ukraine into a greater Russia, but he really wants to roll back the entire democratization that happened uh, in parts of the former Soviet Union, like Ukraine and Georgia and Moldova, uh, but also in Eastern Europe. Uh, I think that he wants to extend his sphere of influence all the way back to what it was uh, at the time of the Cold War. And so the freedom of quite a lot of other countries are resting on this particular fight. I mean, you say quite a lot of other countries, and obviously we've all discussed the threats to the Baltic states and Poland and, and the former Soviet Union. But is it perhaps even bigger than that? I mean, is, is this actually a fight about liberal democracy? Well, it is. Uh, Putin has gotten support from a whole bunch of populist leaders in established democracies. So that includes uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary, Eric Zemmour and, and Marine Le Pen in France, uh, uh, leaders of the AFD in Germany, and Donald Trump and a number of other American conservatives. So he's uh, at the hub of a large web of uh, forces that uh, in democratic countries are nascently authoritarian. Uh, and so therefore he's reaching into the internal politics of uh, a lot of democracies. So it is actually a fight that involves uh, really all of us. If it is so big then, why are we not seeing more calls for the rest of the world to get involved? I think that the real issue right now is whether NATO is willing to get involved directly in a way that would involve a fight with uh, Russian forces directly. That's what's involved in calls for a no-fly zone. Uh, you really can't execute a no-fly zone without directly attacking Russian targets. And you know that has obvious risks of escalation. Um, and that's what uh, I think NATO has been resisting. I think they've been trying to do you know whatever else they could in terms of weapons supply. Uh, and you know that may or may not be enough to really turn the tide uh, of battle. The next level of risk is a really large increment. And I think that's really what's you know what's being debated right now. Well, what is that? I think the risk of nuclear escalation is probably a little bit overstated. I, you know, obviously Russia has a lot of nuclear weapons and could use them, uh, but, you know, any such use would be pretty suicidal. And I think that it's not a step that's going to be easily taken, even by someone as determined uh, as Vladimir Putin. Uh, I think, you know, the more realistic short term worry is turning to chemical or biological weapons and then just continuing to do what he's been doing, which is to kill as many Ukrainian civilians as possible in hopes that this is going to force the Ukrainian uh, government to, you know, to negotiate. But, you know, once you start a war, they never go the way that you expect. And so I think it's very hard to predict the exact ways in which uh, escalation could occur. I mean, do, do you think that the when people draw parallels with the the First World War um, and say, well, they thought that was about an archduke in Sarajevo and look where it ended. You know, that there's any merit in that? Well, yeah, I, I think that this is a general experience in wars that um, once you 
start going down that road, it's very, very hard to predict, you know, how things are going to turn out. At the beginning of the First World War, absolutely nobody thought that this would lend, lead to the end of the German, Austro-Hungarian, and Ottoman empires, but that's where we, uh, that's where we ended up. It's possible that, you know, a, a more peaceful scenario will unfold. Uh, it could be that Putin will see these risks and decide it's simply not worth it. But, you know, for him, it's not an existential fight on the part of Russia itself, because nobody's going to destroy Russia. It is an existential fight, I think, for Putin's regime, because if he loses the conventional war in Ukraine, there are going to be a lot of people going for him inside of Russia itself, because it's going to be such a, you know, such a humiliation. And in light of that, the stakes uh, for him personally are very high. And so I do think it's a bit unpredictable how he's going to try to uh, get out of that. But I mean, if, on, on the one hand, if you say, you know, you don't think even Putin is, is looking to nuclear weapons, um, wh why are you still arguing on your blog, for example, that, you know, we cannot bring in a no-fly zone, we can't do more militarily? You know, if you don't really believe in the risk of nuclear war, then why not get involved? I mean, are you revealing the limits of liberal democracy? No, it's not a limit of liberal democracy. I think that it's a limit of, you know, political prudence, which would apply to any power that's involved in a, in a conflict of this sort. Liberal democracy is involved in the sense that, uh, you know, no democratic state can actually go to war unless it has the consent of its population. It's certainly the case right now that in Washington that does not exist. Uh, you know, there's really no strong support, you know, for even a no-fly zone. But I'm not excluding the fact that this may become necessary, uh, you know, at a fairly early point because uh, there probably is a limit beyond which, you know, these uh, humanitarian outrages can continue, you know, without, uh, without some kind of reaction. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a very difficult choice to make. So you do think it's possible the world becomes so shocked by the number of people killed, that it feels compelled to do something more? Well, there's other, there's other red lines uh, besides that. I mean, if, if Russia begins attacking some of the supply lines that are resupplying the Ukrainian army uh, with more ammunition and weapons, or if the Russians go across the border and actually attack some of the uh, points of resupply in Poland or Romania, uh, uh, then, you know, that would be a, a pretty important red line. As I understand it, the Biden administration has been intensively uh, trying to figure out how they would respond to a chemical or biological escalation. So, you know, there's other ways as well uh, that the war could start spinning out of control. Well, let, let's come then to the end of history, because I, I guess every time something major happens in the world, uh, you know, that there's a huge... Um, reaction to, well, you know, it wasn't the end of history after all, was it? Um, but I, in fact, does, does Putin fall within your whole argument of, of, of what, you know, the, the, the desirable end state, if you like, of progress should be? He and his vision of Russia, you know, this kind of fascist, ultra-nationalist society he's created is not something that looks like it's desirable to almost anybody. Uh, least of all to the Ukrainians that he's trying to bring within his, uh, you know, within his realm. Uh, and that's really what the end of history was about. You know, is there a higher stage of human society that, you know, we are all going to eventually move to? And Russia is about the last place now that I think anybody would want to end up. But why, why has it got there is, the, is, is what we have to understand, isn't it? You know, why didn't Russia go on a, a course of progress um, like much of the former Soviet Union, towards democracy, towards liberalism. Um, instead, it did something quite different. I think, you know, you probably have to explain that through a lot of historical legacies and cultural tendencies that uh, Russian national identity, as it evolved, you know, in the 19th century, uh, even before Bolshevism, was very much tied up with a sense that it really had to be a great power uh, and dominate uh, uh, its neighbors. And 
the loss of that great power status uh, after the breakup of the former Soviet Union was a, you know, a huge blow to the self-esteem uh, of a lot of Russian elites, beginning with, you know, this KGB officer, uh, Vladimir Putin. And so I think it's that sense of lost uh, glory that, you know, and resentment over that loss that's really uh, that's really driving them. And then there's just a lot of accidents of history. If Boris Yeltsin had not appointed Putin, but had appointed, you know, some other uh, leader that didn't come out of the security services, you know, we may have ended up with a very different uh, outcome. I don't want to completely lift the burden off of the West. I think that, uh, you know, the democracies after, at the time of the breakup of the former Soviet Union gave a lot of bad advice particularly in terms of how to manage the economic transition. Uh, and as a result, many uh, Russians associate democracy with this time of weakness and chaos in the 1990s when Yeltsin was president. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that they haven't been very enthusiastic about it. And, and so do you think, um, you know, Russia is on a course and it will stay on that course or could it change post Putin? Yeah, I think it could change. I think that, uh, a lot of the things that Putin has said uh, over the last year, including that long article he published last summer and the speech he gave on the eve of the war, indicates that he personally is preoccupied with this historical trope about uh, you know, the unity of what he considers the Russian people that includes Ukrainians and Belarusians, uh, and that that's a particular fixation. And there's a lot of reporting that he's been extremely isolated and you know, quite paranoid as a result of the COVID epidemic. And so there may be, you know, I, I can't speculate because I don't, you know, I'm not his psychiatrist, but there could be also some personal psychological factors uh, involved that have been motivating this uh, decision that in retrospect looks completely crazy in terms of any kind of Russian national interest. So those may be factors as well. What do you make of what Tim Snyder argues about the politics of inevitability and how we assume that other people may want the same things that we want um, incorrectly? Well, I think that's always been true. I think that, uh, you know, when you look at things from other people's perspectives, you realize that they've got different traditions and uh, uh, different aspirations. The theory uh, that was guiding a lot of what was called modernization theory was this idea that once you develop the middle class, uh, you would also just uh, develop a population that was better educated and had a greater desire for political participation. We've seen that that hasn't worked very well in China. Uh, it, may have been working in Russia because if you look at the, you know, the younger people uh, in big cities like uh, St. Petersburg and Moscow, they're not, you know, that's not Putin's base of support. Uh, and so that's a long-term social trend that under different circumstances may have pushed that country towards more openness and a more liberal society. But unfortunately, you know, it's, it's not the dominant part of the population right now. Yes, I mean, because obviously if there wasn't a war in Ukraine right now, I mean, much of our conversation might be centering on China and where China is heading. And, you know, and, and how, you know, the idea of liberal democracy as a, as a perfect end state for people is just, just wrong when you look at that country. Well, I think that, you know, there's a long tradition of centralized government in China. And I think the Chinese Communist Party has been pretty successful in promoting both economic growth and political stability. And so I think, you know, a lot of people in China, even though they're educated and middle class, you know, buy into that. Uh, the real question for China is whether they can keep it up uh, and maintain that growth and stability, you know, over a longer period of time. But, you know, you have to give them credit that they've, they've done a pretty good job, job at it uh, up till now. Because a lot of people are concerned that the outcome of this war could be a genuinely new world order in which China and Russia are much more closely aligned. There is no desire on their part to be westernized in any way, to be democratic in the way we understand it, uh, or liberal in any way, um, and that we are really seeing a big reordering going on. Do, do you think that's possible? I think that if, 
Putin is successful in achieving his any of his goals of reincorporating at least part of Ukraine back into Russia, and the West can't do anything to stop it, yes, uh, there will be a reordering of, of the world uh, in favor of authoritarian government. On the other hand, if he's stopped uh, effectively on the ground, uh, if he doesn't achieve those goals, and particularly if he faces you know, what looks like a humiliating defeat, then I think uh, the democratic uh, countries will have shown that, you know, they're capable of mutual support uh, and that this trend towards authoritarian government can be stopped. So we're really literally at this crossroads. It's a cliche to say that, you know, we're at an important turning point in history, but I think genuinely you could imagine two outcomes of this war, one of which would be very bad and the other of which would be you know, quite uh, positive. So, so this could actually be an opportunity for us to get serious about liberalism again. It could be a tremendous opportunity if uh, we're successful in stopping Putin. Uh, I think that uh, there's been a lot of cynicism about liberal societies, their weaknesses, their internal divisions. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, I think we're right for a demonstration that that's not the necessary outcome. I mean, to what extent do you think we have brought some of this on ourselves? I mean, your, your book is about liberalism under attack from both left and right and the mistakes that have been made. Um, you know, have, have we weakened ourselves in the eyes of people like Putin? Well, I think that uh, the United States and Europe have both suffered from a lot of internal divisions. We've seen uh, the rise of populist leaders. Uh, Donald Trump seemed to be an actual active ally of Putin. Uh, you know, John Bolton, his security, national security advisor, and other people have said that he intended to pull out of NATO if he had been reelected back in 2020. And so, you know, in some sense, Putin had an active agent working on his behalf inside the United States. I think Putin also assumed that Germany would continue to uh, be a friend of, of Russia's and advocate within the Atlantic Alliance, you know, for a, a, a softer kind of policy. And as a result of those uh, perceived divisions, I think he felt that this was a time to go ahead and stop Ukraine from drifting uh, into the Western camp. He has so far proven to be very wrong on both of those counts because a lot of internal solidarity in the United States to oppose Russia and within the uh, within the NATO alliance. So, you know, this was part of this enormous miscalculation that, uh, that he made. Liberalism clearly means different things to different people. Now, you devote a whole chapter in the book to defining it. I, I, you know, do you have a podcast-friendly answer? To what it is. What I believe is the core of liberalism is a belief in a rule of law and a constitutional order that limits uh, executive power in favor of the ability of individuals to make decisions uh, about their own life courses on their own, uh, and, and that that's guaranteed through a system of rights and law. Uh, that, to me, is the most uh, fundamental characteristic of liberalism, and that means that, you know, social democratic Sweden is just as much a, a liberal state as Margaret Thatcher's Britain. So we should be looking, I suppose, at a new consensus. Well, I uh, I would hope so. I think that one of the problems uh, of the recent uh, decade has been that you've now got an entire generation uh, of young people that didn't experience either the violence of the early 20th century or uh, the dictatorship of communism. and. As a result, I think there's been a lot of complacency that the peace and prosperity of the post-Cold War world was something they could take for granted, that they didn't really have to actively uh, defend a liberal democracy. And I think that the invasion creates a certain amount of moral clarity about what the alternative, at least one of the important alternatives to liberal democracy is. It's the dictatorship that is internally repressive and externally uh, aggressive and violent. And I think people uh, you know, need to be reminded of, uh, to appreciate what, uh, what it is that they've got uh, when they're living in a democracy, in a liberal democracy. I suppose young, some young people though might go, well, look, just because there is a war in Europe and because there are these bold choices uh, around which we have to fight, doesn't mean we have to give up 
on racial justice, gender equality, trans rights, and all of those things that, you know, culture wars and, and the sort of the, the, the tangles between left and right have argued over the last decade? Well, of course not. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, a lot of those struggles are actually on behalf of liberal ideals of uh, treatment uh, of people. But I do think that, you know, when you see uh, Mariupol being bombed in the way that it is, people simply being killed outright, it does tend to put some of our struggles within, you know, I mean, the kinds of struggles that go on, let's say, in Western universities where people are offended by other students speaking certain words and, you know, they say that's violence, you know, I, I regard that as a, uh, you know, a transgression or a, a violent assault on me. I think it puts that kind of complaint in a certain amount of perspective when you see what real violence looks like. So, so do you think, I mean, well, so you hope, I suppose, this will help us get some perspective on you know, what we call cancel culture, free, you know, the freedom of speech argument going on at the moment. Yes, well, not just not just cancel culture, you know, on the right, there's been very uh, prickliness and sensitivity uh, uh, to things like mask mandates and vaccine mandates. You know, there was a case uh, in the United States where a group of right wing protesters showed up at a school board meeting wearing Stars of David yellow stars of David, uh, implying that they were being treated the way that the Jews had been treated under Hitler. And, you know, this, uh, it demonstrates just this extraordinary lack of historical knowledge and sensitivity. But it's also one of the things that might be driven home by this war that, you know, there actually are people that face violent repression. And it's not people that are being asked to get a vaccine. Uh, you know, it's a lot more serious than that. I mean, but isn't there a danger that if you reduce it to that, you put, you know, the, the human rights that the, the people have been fighting over during peacetime into the background and, and you, you potentially wipe out quite a lot of liberal progress? Well, uh, I don't think that there's actually much uh, danger of that. I think you can both appreciate, uh, uh, you know, the kind of peace and security that living in a liberal regime uh, gives you and at the same time realize that that's an uncompleted task and that there still are uh, issues of social justice that need to be addressed. I think you can walk and chew gum at the same time uh, and, and keep both of those uh, ideas in your head uh, simultaneously. So what do you think the challenge then is to this generation of politicians in the West to try and do what you're doing, which is to get a sense of perspective and to unite around some core values? I think that the, the biggest uh, obligation of all of us is to provide mutual support to other struggling democracies. Besides Russia and Ukraine, uh, there's plenty of other authoritarian uh, uh, cases of authoritarian overreach. You know, it's happening in Venezuela, it's happening in Syria, it's happening in Iran, it's happening in, in uh, Syria, and even in a you know, a, a country that's still largely a democracy, India, there's been this shift towards a greater intolerance, you know, of people that are not Hindu in that in that country as a result of the policies of Prime Minister Modi. Uh, Turkey, you know, Hungary, there's, there's plenty of other places where there are people who sympathize with Putin or they would like to be like Putin if they were given a chance. Uh, and I think we have to realize that we have agency to stop them. Do we need new structures to try and deliver this? I mean, what, one of the things that seems very striking at the moment is the total inability of something like the United Nations to achieve anything. Well, I think the uh, a lot of the structures that we have are probably sufficient. You know, there's always been a uh, uh, an idea out there uh, to create a community of democracies, uh, countries that shared a belief in liberal democracy and actually practiced it. Uh, that was the idea behind the democracy summit that Joe Biden held last December. You know, there's a lot of problems with that, beginning with uh, the question of who qualifies to be a democracy and therefore a member of the club. And there are a lot of arguments over this. Uh, and I'm not quite sure that, you know, that's, that's the solution. Uh, I think that 
we can probably use that old Cold War structure, I think maybe sufficient to, you know, to provide that mutual support. You might remember that a few years ago, Emmanuel Macron said that he thought that NATO was brain dead. And I think we've seen a demonstration of the fact that it's actually still uh, continuing to be a very necessary institution. And we should find the value of some of the uh, institutions that we have already. We have an end question on this podcast, which is if you could change the world in any way, how would you change it? I would get rid of Vladimir Putin uh, as a first order of business. Uh, how that happens, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but I think you know defeating his army might be a, a good place to start. Uh, and the Ukrainians look like they're you know moving steadily in that direction. It's very interesting. For the last couple of years, the most common answer to that question is the biggest threat to the world is climate change. Do, do you think we're coming back to the idea that the biggest threat to the world is Putin? Well, I think uh, you you know you have to deal with these threats as they come up. Right now. Uh, you know, there's a very urgent problem in uh, in Europe uh, in terms of this war. Cli that doesn't mean that climate change isn't a big problem, uh, you know, in the long run. So I think we have to keep all of them uh, in our heads at the same time. Francis Fukuyama, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much.